Hello, good evening. It is Sunday, July 12th at 7 p.m. Welcome to another episode of Scranton Fringe Live Dialogue. Um, this series, we've been chatting with various creatives and community leaders from Northeast Pennsylvania and beyond connected to our International Fringe family. Um, for those just tuning in, maybe for your first time, welcome. For those that are joining us every weekend, uh, we really appreciate your support and welcome back. Um, before I introduce our guest, I just wanted to do a little bit of fringe housekeeping and mention that our organization um, is in the running for a very generous beneficiary program through the Mohegan Sun Arena and Gallery of Sound. In the comments section within the next few minutes, I'll be posting a link. It'll be there all night and after this video is goes off and stays up once it's pre -reco once it's recorded. Um, it just takes one minute. There's a lot of worthy organizations being nominated, so we understand. There will be two winners, so we hope you will consider making us one of them. A few seconds on your end can make a world of difference on ours. So again, I'll be posting that link in just a few minutes. But more importantly, I'm going to bring in our featured guest for the evening. We'll be talking about a lot of things, her work, uh, socioeconomic uh, conversations and dialogues within theater, and how to use diversity not only to, in the creativity, and, uh, excuse me, how to use the arts and creativity not only to promote diversity, but using the arts and creativity uh, to cope with the pandemic. We're several months into this, and it's unfortunately not going away anytime soon. Uh, our guest is no stranger. We had her a few weeks ago, and it was a wonderful conversation. Her name is Roya Fami. Roya Fami is currently working as the senior director of the Project for Enhanced Global Understanding at Wyoming Seminary College Preparatory School in Kingston, Pennsylvania. The project brings together Israeli and Palestinian teens to incorporate social justice into their lives, gain conflict transformation skills, and train as future global leaders. She serves as a social and emotional and diversity counselor for the whole entire school community. She's also a licensed psychotherapist who specializes in youth and families of global cultures and world religions. I'm going to skip a little bit through her very, very incredible um, resume. Roya grew up traveling and learning multiple languages and cultures from her family's Iranian, Egyptian, Russian, Turkish heritage, as well as Christian, Jewish, and Muslim faith traditions. She graduated from Lux University with a bachelor's degree in communications and earned a self-designed master's degree in global social work from the University of Maryland at Baltimore. She founded Visions of Tolerance in response to the 9-11 crisis, an international consulting organization to promote conflict resolution and multicultural understanding amongst youth from warring areas of the world, work that she obviously continues at right now with uh, Wyoming SEM. Uh, she is also a theater artist and she writes, directs, and acts at social justice theater. She is available to counsel and coach around challenges and issues of living in a monolithic society and having a pluralistic multicultural identity and so much more we will discuss momentarily. Please welcome to the virtual stage, Roya. Hi, Roya, how are you? Hello, and thank you for that introduction. Hello, NEPA, hello, the US, and hello, international friends. <laughs> welcome, Roya. Um, just a note, your audio is a little lower than it was before. Is um, Can we possibly raise your microphone a little bit? Yep, just raise it all the way. Uh, I can come there closer. Does that help? That's better. Yep. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So. We already have some comments from Curry Mackey. Applause. Hi, Curly. <laughs> applause, 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 applause. Yes. Thank you. We, we, we saw the sound. Um, welcome. Okay. Well, thank you so much for rejoining us. Sure. Sure. Yeah. We had such a tremendous conversation last time. Um, and we had so many comments then. And I, I'm looking forward to the conversation and dialogue that people will join us with tonight. We have a couple of questions that we were sent in ahead of time. But before of we course. get to those, just in case um, we have a new few friends joining us who maybe weren't part of our um, of conversation last time. And obviously I had to you know, give a rough notes of your incredible resume and bio. Mm -hmm. um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a few minutes, can we discuss a little bit about your background using mm -hmm. arts and creativity for social justice, promoting diversity, inclusion, equity, um, and how you approach it overall, and however you want to take that question. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, for the, the theater artist in the audience, when I was eight, I wrote a time machine play where a group <laughs> of my friends and I go back in time and make sure that everybody that was at war in, at, in the United States, whether it be the indigenous people or and or... Um, you know, the 
Americans that were living there or the Americans leaving the British, where they all came together and worked together. So I must have known something in age eight. And um, <laughs> the best thing about the play was we got an empty refrigerator box and decorated it. So that was the time machine. So that was, there was the beginning. Of the Interesting. <laughs> yes, Interesting. it was. Do you have, can you, can you attribute your, I mean, you know, love of theater and the creative arts, there's many people that, you know, are, are attracted to that for various reasons, but yeah. specifically your, your focus and using that as a medium of peace, conflict resolution, even from such a young, early age, can you attribute, is there something you attribute that passion and calling within yourself, or do you think it was totally just something within you? No, I think it's a okay. So what what are we as individuals? We're a combination of of genetics and environment. So, mm -hmm. um, my uh, you know, in my family and my father's side of the family, uh, we have quite a few. And I just found this out because I've been doing these great Zoom conferences with my cousins overseas. We have quite a few doctors who were in films. Um, my father's family is originally from Alexandria, Egypt. Mm -hmm. And when I started speaking to my cousin recently, he said, Roya, I, I, I asked him, I said, you know, I don't see anyone in my immediate family that was drawn to the theater or performing. He said, Roya, there's a group of us here in Cairo and Alexandria. We all we went to med school, but we all did theater. And we all acted in movies. Wow. So that was a that was a wonderful kind of connection for me or ancestral connection and family connection yeah. for me. Um, so the the environmental piece, so that's the environmental piece. Um, I the genetics piece, excuse me. The environmental piece is before I was eight years old, I had traveled through um, most of the continents of the world. And I had probably heard six to seven languages. Mm -hmm. Um, and my mom and dad just took me traveling as a young child and it remained something that I loved. And I think I was mostly drawn, Connor, to the stories that I heard mm -hmm. of my relatives and people. So I remember going around to different people and saying, um, saying, excuse me, could you tell me your story? So mm -hmm. what is theater? Theater is storytelling. Mm -hmm. So I think I was just always very drawn to stories of people of different faith traditions, cultures, um, you know, lifestyles, things like that. Right. So, yeah. That's beautiful. Now, you discussed um, a very, very particular episode from your childhood that your family experienced yes. Um, yes. here in Northeast Pennsylvania. So, I, I mean, while... I just, you know, I think it's important, and I, I, this, I feel bad for rushing through this, but no, 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 um, no. it's important to talk about. Yeah, but I, I think it's important for people to know, as beautiful and cultured and diverse and and warm and welcoming um, a culture and environment, your parents, both ac both intellectuals, academics, right. mom from Iran, uh, dad from Egypt, right. um, but when they and then came over to be educators here and, and community leaders here in Northeast Pennsylvania, right. as beautiful as that was. It wasn't all roses, correct? No, it wasn't all roses at all. Mm -hmm. And there, I think, is my, my dedication to conflict resolution and to multicultural um, and uh, uh, cultural cross-cultural communication. Mm -hmm. When um, I was in grade school, the uh, Ku Klux Klan called my uh, home and threatened to burn a cross on our lawn, our family lawn. And uh, my father, I remember hearing my father on the phone with them and I didn't know who it was until he hung up, but I remember him saying, who are you? Identify yourself, mm. who are you? And they wouldn't identify themselves. They just said, you know, we're the clan, we're coming to burn a cross. My father's response to them was you cowards, you know where I live. You know where my family lives. You're threatening to burn a cross on my lawn. You won't wow. even identify yourself. He hung up. They never, you know, to my knowledge, never bothered us um, directly at our house. And um, I remember uh, feeling, you know, okay, daddy taught me a way, you know, a way to deal with things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was a dramatic moment in itself, Connor. That was a piece sure. of theater within itself. Of course, um, the things that you remember mm -hmm. and um, on the playground as a as a 
as a school age child, I remember going and being called the N word. What had happened was that year, that summer I spent in Egypt and my skin had turned very, very dark. Mm -hmm. And that was just natural to me. I mean, my relatives look like that. My family looked like that. We tan, we tan well in the summertime and in hot in heat. So I remember being pulled up in front of the classroom and my um, teacher was very kind. This is Roya. She just got back from Egypt and, you know, you know, she's going to be in our class. I remember going out into the playground soon after that and kids calling me the N word. I didn't know what the N word was. That was not a word that was ever allowed in my family or ever spoke of in my family. Mm -hmm. Um, That it was very clear. You, you treat people of different colors and cultures with respect. Mm -hmm. So I had to go and ask what that meant. Um, But a child is, (coughs) <coughs> interprets things through feelings and emotions. They don't have the cognitive complex chemistry that an adult does. Um, mm-hmm. So I remember feeling very hurt and very confused. I'm like, I don't understand. I knew it wasn't a good word. I just, I just didn't know what it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. That's, yeah. that's a lot for a child to process and endure. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that you had such a supportive and, and, you know, uh, uh, you know, a well-balanced family background to fall back on for that yeah. support and that education, because there's many, many, many who did not. Um, right. That's and wonderful. Teachers. And, and, and educators. teachers yeah. and educators and family teachers. friends. And yes. Yes. Wonderful educators. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, okay. With that, um, I mean, that, that is a, tip tip of an iceberg of a, of a much bigger conversation but we um, for anyone who wants to learn more about Roya's background and the journey of her work and career you can go back and watch our first episode conversation from a few weeks ago um i just don't want to get too bogged down with um, information we've already discussed um i just want to remind everybody you can as we're having this conversation whether it's just to say hello or you have a specific question or some situation that we discussed that you have your own story and can relate to please 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 feel free to comment below and we will absolutely try to get to it. Hello, Laura. I have someone named Laura. Oh, hi, Laura. How are you? Sorry, I couldn't see the full name. Nice to see you. Um, Great, 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 great. Um, Okay, so Roya, so before I bring up any questions, we are here tonight for many things, but we're going to be talking about using the arts um, for diversity and also as a coping mechanism through this isolation process we're all going through with the pandemic. Um, Correct maybe we should start with diversity. Is there anything to you want to say in particular to open that conversation? Mm-hmm. I'd like to talk about actually both, if I may. Sure. I do a, I do a lot of research. I'm a, I'm a nerd. I love reading. I love research. And I say it proudly. I, was, I said it in our last broadcast, too. I myself was fascinated with... Um, why, does, why do some diversity workshops and conversations work? and some don't. Why is it that some people are more able to cope with conflict, with fear, with anxiety, with a pandemic, Mm -hmm. and some aren't? And it led me to study, and this is not a whole lesson, so no worries, anybody. It led me to (laughs) study some rudimentary brain chemistry. Okay. What I found out was Um, And if anyone here is a neurologist or has studied neurology, please, please, please come and talk to us. What I found out was at the brain stem, there is the section of the brain that we call the evolutionary section of the brain or the, um, I guess, reactive section of the brain. That's the section of the brain we needed uh, when we were first here on Earth that goes to fight, flight, or freeze. Okay, Mm -hmm. so something is approaching me. I'm in danger. I'm either going to fight it. I'm going to run away or I'm going to freeze and pretend they don't see me or maybe pretend I'm not here or pretend I'm dead. Mm -hmm. The second or middle part of the brain um, actually gets us a little bit out of that and shows us that there are options and choices to the fight, flight or freeze. And then the frontal part of the brain carries what I call the tend and befriend and 
go to groups and community and reach out part of the brain. So this is not, again, I am not a scientist. I am not a neurologist. This is my language using this. What I learned was the more we can remove people from the fight, flight, freeze part, the reactivity part, and we can move them into the, it's called executive functioning, the ability to look at each other as adults, to communicate much better, um, things like that, the better things will work. What I uh, learned is in my diversity work, if I take time and do an exercise, that brings people from the lizard part of the brain. Some people have um, discussed it as the lizard part of the brain. Yeah. Into the frontal part of the brain, they're better able to communicate. They're able to self-regulate emotionally and they're better able to create as well. Okay. So all of us here who are artists, we all know it's very hard to create when we're in fight, flight, or freeze. Mm-hmm. So I learned that that works for diversity, for conversations, for cross-cultural communication, and it also works for creativity to get out of that, that place of fear, that place of anxiety, that place of being frozen. Mm -hmm. So that to me was fascinating. That's what we're doing. We're literally switching into a part of our brain that can function. And then... And Go ahead. No, 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 no. Please continue. I'll, my, yeah. I'll, I'll ask my question at the end. Yeah. And then we are also spiritual beings. Um, so I'm all about meditating, which again brings us to that front part of the brain. But um, we as artists, we have that. We have, we have, everybody does. The, our spirit, our soul, you know, that need to create. Um, and it will, it will work together in tandem with that part of the brain so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. with every with everything you just said because there's so much we could uh, no pun intended dissect yeah um, thanks <laughs> but with that within that so with everything you just said what then and i know the i know there's lots of answers to this but in your professional opinion well, what is the most typical um roadblock because everything that you said it sounds very much like it's intrinsically our our desire to communicate our desire to understand and be understood and yet we see time and time and time and time again mm -hmm. especially at you know major global levels and national levels and you know even regional levels we see that those conversations aren't happening that easily so what where where are we where are we as a society putting up those roadblocks we as society aren't necessarily putting up those roadblocks we're, mm. uh, but we're not necessarily offering healthy options and choices. The name of that roadblock, Connor, is trauma. Mm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I am talking about individual trauma. I'm talking about group trauma. I'm also talking about ancestral trauma. Mm -hmm. Many of the different cultures, many of the different um, faith traditions have ancestral trauma. And again, there have been studies, and I'm a big believer that, yes, ancestral trauma does carry down through the ages, um, family trauma, that's the roadblock, that's the roadblock. So what we need to do, and this goes to, to speak to my fellow educators and um, social workers, social justice workers, is to make sure our youth, our children, our youth in this country have a chance to work right. through that trauma, to acknowledge. Now, it's 2020, it's July of 2020, we're all in trauma now. COVID-19 mm. COVID has traumatized not up, just us, the world. Right. That's the block. That's the block. Um, and that's why it's so important to do the work that will bring us to the frontal part of the brain and bring us to connecting with our creative spirit and our ability to communicate. You know the lizard brain back here? It stops mm -hmm. us from, literally, it stops us from communicating. Mm. Okay. So yeah. Yeah. Interesting. It's, we're frozen. We're frozen in the trauma. So yeah. So the answer how is do we use, how do we use creativity and maybe more specifically theater to unfreeze that, to yeah. get out of our reptilian mindset? Yeah. Well, I would say a lot of my um, mentors in the world, um, I don't necessarily know them, but they are playwrights and actors and, um, 
uh, theater theater artists who have taken tra traumatic events and have written about them and have channeled them into characters or full blown plays. I was going through my bookshelf tonight and I found Anna Devere Smith's Fires in the Mirror. And mm -hmm. um, Anna Devere Smith, um, for those of you who don't know, is a very well known, you know, playwright, actress, um, theater artist, and she also is uh, very, very dedicated to social justice. In the early 1990s, before many of you were born, <laughs> sure, um, Los, there was a racial incident that sparked riots in the city of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I happened to be in Los Angeles when those riots broke out, uh, and um, it was extremely traumatic. And what Anna Devere Smith did, which was brilliant, is she wrote the show Fires in the Mirror. And what she did is she made herself 15 or 20 different characters and how those characters experience the trauma. Mm. So she's one. And then any of the, if anybody chooses to or wants to discuss the world of psychodrama or sociodrama, yeah. The focus of psychodrama and sociodrama is to get people to express trauma through theatrical means, through acting, through writing, through creating of a character, through improvisation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could you give us a, a very, I know that's a yes. big, could you give us an example of like a, a hypothetical psychodrama yes. exercise? Okay. Yes, um, I have one right here actually oh. called Prepared to Have Gloria, before we move on, we did have one, yes. I just before we move on, we had a question um, that oh, I wanted please. to bring up. Someone was asking that the racist episode was that in the area, was in this area. Um, yes, it was. It was in NEPA. Hi, Elaine. It was in Northeast Pennsylvania. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Um, thank you, Elaine. Yes, that, that episode um, did occur in this region. So thank you for that. It's not, I'm glad we could clarify that. Um, but yes, Roy, you were saying the, the psychodrama exercise, you were going to grab something. Okay, so um, the psychodrama exercise is called pair tab paired tableau. Pair tableau. And it, it comes from the work of a gentleman I mentioned at our first conversation, Connor, the uh, Augusto Boal. Oh, Boal of the Theater yeah. of the Oppressed. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And mm -hmm. um, if people want to, um, you know, do do some more research into his work. Augusto Boal was a Brazilian. Um, actually a social justice worker he came up with with street theater yeah uh, in brazil and it was all to gather rights for the farm workers in brazil mm -hmm. and those who were uh economically disenfranchised so uh it's you'll recognize this connor and many of the theater people will recognize this is you pair off you find somebody to work with and one is a one person is a and one person is b person a expresses a feeling or a thought or something maybe they're going through person b gets to become a sculptor and sculpts the body of person mm. a mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then you switch and then you sit with each other and you connect over the feeling, the story, the thought that you had. And, um, and because it's such a sensory exercise, it, it, it really aids in that connection too. You know, you have to, I always say, ask somebody before you touch them. You never want to touch somebody. Right. Just reach out. But if both people are comfortable being touched, in appropriate places, you actually are sculpting a human body into a story or mm -hmm. a feeling. And that's from a that's from Wiles work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. And what mm -hmm. kind of how visceral a response have you an emotional responses in all of these exercises have you witnessed firsthand? I've seen a lot. I've done a lot of studying of sociodrama, drama therapy, um, psychodrama, and I have seen everything from smiles to tears to laughter to um, complete shock and surprise. You really got me. You really understood what I was saying, you know, 
Mm -hmm. um, so I've seen, I've seen, I've seen the gamut of, of mm -hmm. um, I've never seen a disconnect. That's one thing I've never seen. Hmm. I've never seen a disconnect. I've never seen like, oh, that didn't, I don't get it. Or that didn't matter to me. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Where, where, um, what, so is psychodrama something that only theater artists and theater professionals can engage in or should do? No, absolutely not. I mm -hmm. always rec I would recommend that if you are a if you are a psychotherapist, a social worker, a psychologist, and you are interested in the modality of theater, I would more than encourage people to to, to healers to study psychodrama, and I would also encourage theater artists to study psychodrama, drama therapy, um, you know, sociodrama. I would also encourage encourage anybody that teaches or does group work. Sociodrama is an excellent tool um, to, uh, to, I can give you an example of this too. Please. To have somebody respect your opinion or to have somebody, not, not necessarily respect, but put themselves in your shoes. Yeah. So put themselves in your shoes. So um, one of the exercises I did is a sociodramatic exercise I used with my Palestinian and Israeli kids when I was at SEM. And I read off a list of values. For example, you know, I believe in hard work. Um, I believe in respecting my parents, you know. Um, I believe that peace building is an important skill. And what I would do is I would read off each value and I would say, go to this side of the room if you agree with that mm. and go to this side of the room if you disagree and come to the middle of the room if you're not sure. Mm -hmm. And then I would remain silent and I would have them look around the room and then they could think and they could process, oh, this person matches my value. This person isn't sure. This person disagrees. I, I really love that exercise. And that, that can be done in really big groups too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. I, there's a video series online. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but that reminds me quite a bit. I mean, they clearly pulled from um, whether knowingly or unknowingly this exercise and trend, but it's usually a group of people that it's, it's sort of a breakdown of do all you know, gay people think the same. Do all exactly. women, yeah. it's like, it's typically like a stereotypical, a stereotypical group. Right. And then it showcases the nuance and the very stark opinions. Um, and it'll be like, you know, somewhat agree, very agree, totally agree, somewhat disagree, yes. like the, the degrees of agreement. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That's fascinating. What has been, and I'm, this is a big question. What has sure. been one of the most like what like profound or just like whoa moments that as a facilitator that you've experienced and of course spe non-specific just non-specific names but just yeah you know yeah. what has really been like a you know walked in thinking this is just going to be an everyday exercise and then you facilitated and there was like a sincere wow moment mm -hmm. um if i may answer that question it's actually not something i necessarily facilitated it was a it was a summer institute on peace building okay and facilitation. It was with one of my mentors, uh, Armand Volkus, who lives in uh, the San Francisco area, but travels the world and does facilitation and peace building. There's a university two and a half hours south of um, Washington, D.C. It's in a small okay. town called Harrisonburg, Virginia. And the name of the university is called Eastern Mennonite University. And it is known around the world for a place for facilitators to come study, peace builders to come study. Every summer, Eastern Mennonite University um, sponsors what's called the Center for Justice and Peace. And that was one of the happiest summers of my life. Wow. It was almost like going back to camp as a kid. <laughs> my roommates and sweet mates were from Let's see, I had Jordan, Lebanon, Palestine, San Francisco. I had Kenya, Uganda, Canada. Wow. Um, 
So there were all of us from all over the world and um, a particular workshop that I studied, and this is with my mentor, Armin Volkas, was the use of psychodrama and sociodrama in facilitation. One of the things he did to have us get in touch with, remember I said trauma is what's blocking us. Mm -hmm. The trauma was bring an object from a family member or ancestor mm. and be ready to tell that story. So he beforehand, he contacted all of us, the workshop. People brought photographs, jewelry, um, you know, cloth, pieces of clothing. Um, someone from the indigenous uh, nations brought uh, part of a headdress. Mm -hmm. um, and all of us went around and talked about our families, talked about our ancestors. And then we talked about what trauma perhaps they had gone through. And then we really spent the rest of the week doing facilitation processes. And it, it didn't just connect us as a group. And that was seven years ago. And to this day, I'm in touch with about more than half of that group. We're all over the world doing this work and we're still in touch. It brought us to a kind of peace internally. Mm. That, that was probably my most, the most powerful moment in facilitation. Um, yeah, was that was that workshop was being a being a participant. Another one that comes to mind is I did work. You and I talked about this. Um, I've talked about this a lot, Connor. I did many years of work with an organization called Seeds of Peace. Yes. Seeds of Peace is dedicated to bringing together youth from warring areas of the world. Mm -hmm. So I particularly at that time was working with Arab and Israeli youth. And one uh, one day after a facilitation workshop, I was going for a walk and a young woman came up to me and said, Miss um, Roya, can we talk? And she had a box. Uh, she was a young uh, Arab woman. She had a box and she was painting the flag on uh, of her country on the box. And she said, one of my teammates from Israel told me to erase that flag. And she was very upset. So we talked. Wow. So I pulled in her teammate and I said, let's all of us just sit down. Let's talk about what's going on. And the young man that was her teammate spent the first week of camp carrying around a baseball bat. And everyone noticed him. He was a young Israeli man and everyone noticed him. And I said, you know, what's going on and why do you feel the need to tell this young woman she can't put her flag on the box? And he said, I was told by my parents to always carry a weapon because anybody in the Arab world could attack me. Wow. So we went on and it took the rest of camp, but we went on and what he learned and what she learned, she learned, she learned to, to express herself no matter what. Mm -hmm. What he learned was the Arab kids that he was playing baseball with and he was doing regular camp activities with and um that he was having you know lunches with and dinners with were not his enemy mm -hmm. so that was that was a really profound experience that was longitudinal took over took over a long period of time but yeah wow. that's yeah. incredible thank you. thank you yeah yeah it is it is i remember all of it you know and that was multiple years ago <laughs> that was more than seven years ago um I don't want to shift gears too harshly, um, but just to <laughs> just to um, maybe bring up one or two of the questions we were sent in mm -hmm. ahead of time. Um, I'm going to start with these two are kind of similar, but I'm going to start the one one's a little bigger, so I'll start with that one just to sure. that'll probably cover the bases. So, um, you know, Scranton Fringe uh, deals with you know not only are we an organization, but we work with a lot of organizations. Correct. So a lot of our reach and a lot of people who might be watching this, you may be respective leaders or team members of companies or nonprofits or Correct. other other arts groups. So this question, I think, is is very much based in the idea of a systemic uh, racism and and lack of diversity, or the, the 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 attempts at diversity in more of a 
organized, structured manner. Sure. Not so much interpersonal. Um, and this says, how can, and it specified white leaders, better engage with diverse artists, audience, and team members in a genuine way, letting people know we welcome their input and participation without seeming disingenuous. Um, uh, great question. That, that seems to be a big, uh, you know, the, and what I'll, I'll show you. The other question was, what do you consider performative allyship grace? And that was from Twitter. Um, yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so that, that seems to be a common theme, right? Is that yeah. there seems to be a lot of people in leadership positions or just ev anyone who wants to be better, who wants to learn and grow, but feels that they're either being performative and they're not doing the right thing or they mm -hmm. it's disingenuous and and simply yeah. piggybacking on what sh what is what what some are considering a trend yes. um, at the national, which obviously, and uh, Glennis from the Black Scranton Project and I discussed this last week. Obviously, yes, it's not a trend. Um, yeah. You you if you choose to view it that way, that's unfortunate. Um, so yeah, how would you respond? To, I'll put that first question back on the screen for for reference. Okay, how can white leaders better engage with diverse artists? audiences and team members in a genuine way, letting people know that we welcome their input and participation without seeming disingenuous. Okay, I have a couple of answers to that. The first answer to that is get ready to work over a longitudinal, a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Okay, And I'm going to tie in the performative question. I'll give you an example. I'm a diversity consultant. I, I'm hired by companies all over um, the world. And I'm actually working right now with one that has offices all over the country. Mm -hmm. The very well-meaning leadership came to me and said, you know this topic. We don't. We'd like to bring you in for two town hall meetings. And we think that's going to address the issues we have here. And if you could please tell us in the second town hall some things individuals in our company can do if they are faced with an uncomfortable matter, as opposed, you know, uh, ex mm. excuse me, um, examples of, of, you know, race, culture, different mm -hmm. lifestyle, what, you know, whatever you want to call it. And my first comment to them was that's a tall order for two, two meetings. meetings. Yeah. Yeah, that's a tall order. That that you know, I am going in there. I I did write a proposal. I did recommend that it's more than two workshops. You know, if they do want want me to do two, then I've got very manageable goals, and I'm telling them what I can do. But I think the answer is you know, be ready to engage over a period of time. Mm -hmm. To both to both answers. Number two, um, please don't go up to people of color we'll call it BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, People of Color. Please don't go up to people with different lifestyles and say, teach me how to act around you. Don't, mm. please don't do that. We don't speak for everybody right. in our population. None of us do. And you know, that onus is on you. If you want to know there are books to be read. There's Black history to be to be um, investigated. Um, you know, uh, really engage yourself and do your own work and your own research. I would like to recommend a book to the the person who asked the question, and it's a book written by a friend of mine, and it's called Coming to the Table. And my friend Tom. And his partner, Sharon, his working partner, Sharon, Tom is Caucasian. Sharon is a black American woman, drove across the country and brought uh, people of color and whites together. Book suggestion coming to the table. Yes. Um, and brought them together for dinners and just listened. And they found a modicum of success. They found people were willing to have the hard conversations. It is mm -hmm. not easy to have these conversations. Mm -hmm. However, when someone is in your home, having a meal with you, sitting right across from you, then it's more difficult to avoid it if that's what your two facilitators and two visitors are there for, you know? And that was the whole idea of the Seeds of Peace camp as well. 
Right. No, we could go in, we could fly to Israel, we could fly to Egypt, we could go in and do workshops. But what if they came to an actual American summer camp and they ate together and played softball and, you know, did all the camping thing, kayaking, swimming, everything. Yeah. So please don't be afraid to engage, authentically engage um, and, and do your research. It's out there. Mm -hmm. You know, Cornell mm -hmm. West, um, Cornell West's work, Race Matters. Uh, you know, there's so many excellent authors. Um, right. Yeah. yeah. Don't treat the person next to you or in the next cubicle as a Google for you. No, no, right. we're not. We're not. We're individual. We're our experiences. We are our cultures. We are our upbringing. Right. Yeah. Um, a common theme or a common thread that I keep... Um, uh, hearing from many people when we, when that kind of question is asked, or even you know when I'm doing my own research, and this was probably one of the harder things for me to accept because you know I want the answer and I want to you know and I I'm I'm happy that you know the work isn't what I'm afraid of, but it's the it's the idea of like be prepared that you might you're gonna you might mess up you're probably gonna mess yes. up. Yeah. be prepared that, to sit in the uncomfortableness be prepared yeah. to sit and the idea of that you know you know, the idea that that doesn't make you a horrible person. It doesn't right. make you, but, but, but it doesn't absolve you of responsibility either. Like there are these two things can be true. You can right. be a good person, but still, you know, you know, um, play, you know, fall victim and, and perpetrate and, you know, some really, you know, negative um, right. traits that we've been programmed with yes. that we've been taught. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's, I would be curious to hear your thoughts on this. I think that's also something that we're, we're, you know, I can only speak to my experience growing up, you know, in the American public school system in the night, in the late nineties, early two mm thousands, -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, through the mid, the 2010, the 2000 aughts, whatever we're calling that. <laughs> the aughts, right. The aughts, uh, there's this, there's this, there's this, there was this, um, version of American racism as it one, it was this thing that we dealt with and we're pretty much past it. Mm -hmm. um, and that, and it was also this thing of like, oh, and it, it, it pops its head up and oh, isn't that unfortunate? There was never a real convert. It was always emotional and it was always the right. raw and the surface level. Right. Rarely right. did it, was it ever, I mean, I can only speak to that after high school, rarely in my public, you know, growing up education, was it ever really verbalized to me that it was intentional, right, that it was right. that it was built into the system? It wasn't just oh, people being ignorant and then this happened. It's right. like no, no, no. They knew what they were doing. Like the powers that be at that time knew exactly what they were doing, mm -hmm. and this was an intentional. And I so I think that that's, I think that's off. I think that's sometimes something people often struggle with. Do you do you run into that as well in your various work and fields, whether it's American or? the Israeli-Palestinian, con you know, the, the conflicts that you, you deal with a lot with your work or any, you know, cross-cultural conflict. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, if I could pull out something you said, Connor, sure. which is the victim-perpetrator cycle, I think that's very much, very important to, mm -hmm. um, to, to establish that and to talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I was, I've been reading on, on, of course, cross-cultural communication, and then I've been reading a lot more. I am not a Buddhist myself, but I'm fascinated with Buddhism. I've, I've, uh, I've been reading a lot about Buddhism, and there was a, um, a Buddhist scholar who suggested that we really can't do work on race or culture um, or any kind of work until we leave the model of victim perpetrator and go to the model of compassion. And in that model of compassion is understanding that each of us has victim and perpetrator inside of us. Mm. So I think it's very profound. So it, it tells me that there is a model out there of working where each of us realizes there is victim and perpetrator within. And then we recognize it on the outside in our society. And then could we try to come to each other with compassion instead of a hierarchy? Basically? Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we had a question yeah, sure. from Elaine. Uh, I'm not gonna bring the whole comment onto the screen. I'm just gonna uh, sure. summarize it a little bit. Um, 
and this isn't this really isn't a topic we touched on. So if you don't feel like talking about this, we don't have to. Um, but the question was about cultural appropriation. Mm -hmm. um, I have read what it means to several people, but don't really understand the difference between admiration and appropriation. And then she goes on to ask that why uh, does the does the does, does the is it okay for the minority to pull from the majority, but not vice versa? Um, I'm happy to. Uh, let, would you like to uh, answer that question? Um, hi, Lane. Thank you for that excellent question. Mm -hmm. I don't. I I think we are in the middle of still defining cultural appropriation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one person's cultural appropriation is another person's admiration. Right. So that's all I can say right now. Um, I would certainly be happy to continue to communicate with you if I can, you know, I'd like to do some more thinking on it and some more reading on it. But, um, uh, yeah. you know, I, I, I belong to a lot of um, feminist, um, you know, feminist groups online and uh, a lot of cross-cultural groups online and cultural appropriation is certainly something we talk a lot about, a lot about, and it can bring up a lot of anger in people. So right. yeah, Connor, you, um, take, you take, you take the question. No, and I mean, I am no expert on this. Um, I, I, I only can speak to this because I attended a workshop on this very subject. Oh, good. Um, okay. That I, that I that I absolutely it was a two hour workshop that does that that barely begins to crack the surface. Um, and and Roy is right that it's an ongoing conversation. I will just say, the one thing I do feel comfortable um, and confident in Elaine. Thank you for the question. Um, in that uh, you know, as an artist, um, and I'm sure if I go back really through my catalog of work, I'm sure I felt guilty to it. But from my understanding, having speaking with people. Um, Elaine, is that it's it's taking something, it's cherry picking, right? Something from a culture, and typically, and this can be anything, but often the things that we, as you know, white homogenized American culture, cherry pick, are often very significant, very regarded um, cultural uh, symbols, fashions, uh, you know, um, um, ceremonies even, and we totally minimize and trivialize and joke. So one example is, you know, in, uh, Native, uh, you know, indigenous uh, First Nations here in North America and South America, you know, mm -hmm. taking their headdresses and turning them into a Halloween costume. You know, a culture mm -hmm. is not a costume. Um, you know, I think that we can, you know, just that's a very broad example. But if you you know, went out wearing, you know, an, an indigenous person's headdress as a costume, because isn't it funny, isn't it cute? That's a little, that that's demeaning, isn't it? And well, so we have no idea the either spiritual, cultural, ceremonial, or just societal significance of that headdress. Now, Elaine, if you attended a workshop and an indigenous artist taught you how to create some kind of craft or product, and you did that in your spare time, you know, that's, you took the time, you learned from someone who truly has that life experience. And it's, I'm not, I, I, there's probably a more succinct way to say what I'm trying to say, but to me, that's where the difference lies is what is the, not, not just the intent that's part of it, but more importantly, you know, what is the significance of what you're appropriating? Um, a big thing is also when, and I can, in the arts world, when typically, you know, the majority dominant culture, which would be white, you know, cisgendered normative America, takes something from a, a distinct element from another culture, not only does it, but never acknowledges and gives credit that, hey, I was inspired by, you know, almost tries to pass it off as m an original concept. Yeah. Um, and Elaine, the last thing I will say um, is that, you know, the, when, when the dominant culture has systemically oppressed or you know, you know, intentionally dominated and, and and oppressed and and segregated another culture, and force that cult and force that as the dominant culture. You really can't call the other way. You can't really say the other way. It, you know, reverse cultural appropriation. It doesn't really work that way. No. Um, if I tell you for if I as a society tell you for hundreds and hundreds of years, this is right, that's wrong. This is right, that's wrong. This is right, that's wrong. And you decide to adopt and adapt certain trends, let's say fashion or, you know, um, appearance, that's not, you can't really appropriate. You can't really appropriate from hierarchically above you. Um, 
And obviously that's not real, it's not a real hierarchy. It's been, it's an imposed hierarchy. Right. Um, so that's a long-winded answer <laughs> to that much bigger, and as Roya more wisely said, it's a much bigger conversation than we can handle in this video chat. I did, I did remember a conversation that a group of us had um, mm -hmm. on, on one of the groups, and that was about black hair. And one, mm. of the, one of the excellent comments was from a woman who said, you know, we have dreads, we have cornrows, we have certain hairstyles, and people have been uh, told in the business world that they cannot wear certain hairstyles. Mm -hmm. they told, and then there have been, there have been lawsuits against it. Mm -hmm. but, but when a somebody from the dominant culture, white, cisgender, dominant culture, wears a black hairstyle, wears cornrows, where I'm, I'm thinking of um, like the Kardashians and the people that kind of hang around with them. I don't know, I haven't seen their show, but I've seen pictures. Mm -hmm. um, we all giggle and think it's cute and it's funny. Um, right, right. Yeah. So right. that was one conversation a group of us a group of us had, yeah. Right. I th um a friend of mine just privately messaged me, um, Jeremy, yeah. thank you, to uh, just more <laughs> he was trying to he was helping me out that Elaine, when we were talking about the majority to the minority, you know, taking from the minority as appropriation, the minority um, to the majority that wouldn't be considered appropriation, we would call that assimilation. Yeah. You know, in a lot of ways. And and, and you know, we've right. done that for hundreds and hundreds of years and multiple cultures have done that. Um, so yeah, but no worry, you're right. There's, there's all, there's, there's constantly, you know, in, in one community and culture where it originates from it's unprofessional and it's, you know, it's frowned upon, but yet when then it's assimilated or uh, excuse me, appropriated all of a yeah. sudden it's cute and it's trendy and it's, you know, I mean the, the American 20, 20 for, 21st century, especially, you know, fashion world, makeup world is pulls, so much from women of color and from you know black and African and brown communities in America and right. you know and it's one thing to say oh we're all just sharing we're all just people you can say that but then when the numbers are showing that black and brown entrepreneurs and and makeup artists and fashion designers are not are are, are statistically systematically proportionally not seeing money for their work not seeing the money and the revenue from their culture's work that they've, you know, adapted and brought into the 21st century, that's where the problem is. It's not just yeah. someone doing something tacky. It's there are real hard financial, societal, economic implications when appropriation occurs. And, and, and that's just one element. And, you know, the offense goes on and on and on. Um, but thank you, Elaine, for the question. That was a, that was a good, that was a good, um, Tangent. If anyone has anything to add to that, please do. Um, Roya, is there anything else in, tonight in particular you really wanted to make sure we discuss that we haven't already? Well, I have a um, a challenge for the people listening tonight, which is one of the things we read in the dominant cisgender culture is that Elvis was the quote unquote father of rock and roll. Yes, yes. Um, I am going to encourage those of you who are listening and those of you who, you know, may listen to a, um, you know, rebroadcast, go find out who the real people were that originated rock and roll. Cause it right. wasn't him. Right. It wasn't him. Right. So yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, and again, to go back to what we were saying before, he didn't, he didn't only get the credit and the popularity, but again, that came with money. And, and that came with yeah. power and that came with generational wealth so yeah. that his children and his, you know, yeah, I agree. Yeah. So, um, yeah, no, I just, I just would like to, you know, shameless plug. I run my own diversity consulting company. I'm available to consult. How can we find more information about that? Sure. Um, I am actually having a person build my website right now okay. and, um, <laughs> Uh, but people can email email me at the same email that we talked about in our last broadcast, which it's just my first name dot last name at gmail dot com, um, and the website will be up. And uh, yeah, so yeah. I mean, it's we've just been chatting for just that hour flew by. Um, yes, 
Yes, it That's, did. Um, what, um, just to not to minimize anything we talked about, but just to end, what are you personally reading, watching, um, you know, uh, taking in right now outside of your, you know, professional and, you know, more intellectual based work? What are you watching? What are you reading? Okay. Well, I want to give a shout out to um, Wyoming Seminary. One mm -hmm. of the things the president and administration did was they asked us, uh, those of us who are educators, staff, administration, to pick one book that addresses culture, race, cross-cultural communications. And um, I am reading Just Mercy. I'm reading Brian. Um, oh, my goodness. Why am I... Uh, there's a film about it and then his book. I, I'll think of his last name. Brian just, Stevenson. Thank you. Yes. Yes. And uh, thank Google. you. Connor. And um, uh, he also came and spoke at Wilkes many years ago. And I, and I got a chance to ask him to, um, to sign a couple of copies of my book. So I'm reading that. I'm I'm watching on Netflix a highly recommended show. All my friends are telling me called Mrs. America, and it's about. Did you see it? No, but I've seen. No, but it's on my list. Is it out? Yeah, it's out, and um, it's about Phyllis Schlafly and the anti ERA movement, and it also has all the early feminists in it and how they, what they had to do to get a voice at the Democratic Convention, the Republican Convention of 1972, um, why uh, the fact that Shirley Chisholm was the first black woman running for president, why mm -hmm. the nomination went to McGovern instead of her. It's fascinating. It's race, it's culture, it's... Um, it's feminism, it's anti-feminism. So I, I recommend it. Uh, it. So many people told me to watch it. So those are the two things that I'm, I'm doing. And I'm rereading the book that I recommended, my friend Tom's book, Coming to the Table. Coming to the Table. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, Michael commented, thank you. Nice conversation. Thank you, Michael. Hi, uh, Mike. For, for joining you. us. That was very nice. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, yeah. We are just passing the hour mark. Um, uh, last call, if anyone has any comments or questions while we're here, you can always reach out to Roya. I'm gonna put that email address on the screen one more time, roya.fami at gmail.com. Um, yeah. I'm gonna take this opportunity to plug uh, Fringe is, I did not comment with it yet. I'm going to do that right, nope, that's not it. Um, while we're chatting, I'm gonna do that right now. We are uh, Gallery of Sound and there are, uh, Mohegan Sun Arena and Wilkes-Barre are doing a really cool outdoor drive-in style concert on July 16th. Nice. Um, and so they are it's benefiting numerous arts and cultural organizations in the area, such as the FM Kirby Center, the Scranton Cultural Center, the Little Theater of Wilkes-Barre. Um, the list goes on and on and on. And they are adding two more beneficiaries to the list. And Fringe Festival happens to be one of the finalist nominees. You technically can nominate anyone, but there is a list of like set nom finalists and then there's a write in, you know, section. Um, there's a lot of great no organizations nominated. It honestly feels a little weird to be competing right now, but uh, so is the way of mm -hmm. the world. Um, mm -hmm. And so those of you that are enjoying these weekly chats, um, those of you that tune in week after week for these conversations, those who love our festival, um, those who are going to be coming this fall for our under glass program that we're going to be testing. Um, if you benefited or appreciated the emergency artist fund that we launched that distributed over $8,000, the list of our programs goes on and on and on. I'm commenting it right now. Okay. So you can actually go to on the Scranton French Facebook page at this video in the comment section, you'll see the link. To the, it's just, it'll take you three seconds. If you like all of this programming and work and you can take one second to go and cast this vote, it really, really could make a big difference this year. Arts, we, and we've been very fortunate, but arts and culture funding is at an all time critical low. And it's, and, you know, our revenue is slashed across the board since so much of our work was dependent upon gathering in physical space and, you know, artists and production fees. So that's my little plug for the night. I'm gonna, I'll throw that in the comments section. So please do that if you can. Um, uh, please reach out to Roya Fami if you are interested in one of her many, many wonderful services. Um, please check out the books and the resources and continue to do your own research. 
that she was discussing on last, last, real, real, last call, everyone, for comments and questions. Roya, what are you doing with the rest of your Sunday evening? When we oh, tonight? Oh, my goodness. Um, probably reading more. Uh, I think it's going to be reading and just having delicious cold lemonade or iced tea because it's so hot and humid. So, um, yeah. Roya, while we're talking, actually, I'm going to go off screen for just two seconds. There's a book I actually wanted to recommend to you. Oh. Um, it's a it's a fiction book, so no one get too excited. Uh, <laughs> one second, one second. Yeah. You all get a better view of my messy bedroom. Okay. Uh, it is called The Weight of Ink by Rachel Kadish. Oh, Kaddish. can I go get it? It's on my nightstand. Connie. No, it is not. It is. Go you get want it. Me to go get it. <laughs> yes. yes. Go get it. Shut everyone. This is not planned. Go get it. Yeah. This is not planned. We're that not is planned. We're not playing. No, Roya. I swear to God, all day I've been thinking about like, oh, Roya's gonna right love. <laughs> I'm not done. So, to, so to be fair to everyone, I'm not done. Uh, I'm only a few hundred pages in. It is it is quite a read. Um, for though until until Roya gets back, it is set in London of the 1660s and of the early 2000s. It interwoves the tale of two women, Esther. And Helen, um, it's it's a phenomenal uh, Jewish p uh, piece of Jewish fictional history. It's really it won the National Jewish Book Award. It it's it's these two women's. That's hysterical. Okay, I, I'm not one. To, I'm not one to say that. You know, I mean, there we clearly we. I mean, you know, Google knows who they're selling to. <laughs> yes, they do. Or their synchronicity, or we'll call it synchronicity. Oh, yeah. that's amazing. How, did you finish it? Or are you still working on it? Oh no, I'm still working on it. It's it's just so rich. I do. It's so you know, rich, and her description. And I sit down to I I, I sit down. I'm like I can only afford like 20 minutes, and an hour will go by. Yes. Um, and I find myself going back and reading pages over and over and over because there's so much. I mean, it's it's not it's not it's it's fascinating and it moves, but there's so much detail. Um, yes. We're not getting paid to say this. That's so funny. That is so funny. No. Yeah. And and I do have to say, I picked it up in a bookstore in Israel. That's where I got it. One of the, um, I was I was wandering kind of in the bookstore to look for something to read, and it caught my eye, and I thought, oh, this is great. So yeah, yeah. I, I will I will take less interesting credit. Um, I bought this online while while under quarantine. So, <laughs> no, that's good um, too. <laughs> but it, it's so good. It's so so good. So anyone out there who, if you like this conversation and you you like what we've been talking about, clearly you know, our taste coalesce in this book. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. When you finish Roya, let me know. I'm, cause I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to have this done within a week or two. Um, okay, I'm good. hoping to power through this week and uh, finish good. it. That's good. hysterical. Wow. That good. is a liberal echo chamber. If I ever heard one. Okay. Um, <laughs> so again, thank you everyone for tuning in. If you're watching this after the fact, please reach out to Roya. Please reach out to the fringe, thank cast you. your vote um, and you know, stay safe and we'll talk to you all soon. Oh, join us next week. Same time, same place. We have Molly Balloons, a uh, phenomenal balloon, balloon and performance <laughs> artist, comic, yeah. Instagram, celeb. And then the following week, July 20th, and Scranton Fringe alum. And then the following week, July 26th, we have Erica Smith, an incredible mental health professional, and as well as a regional-based LGBTQ, specifically trans activist. Wonderful. So we are very, very excited for all of our wonderful guests. Thank you again, Roya, and everyone have a good night. Good night, everyone.